Please let's close our eyes for prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you very much for our Bible study today. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for the love and the interest you've given us for your word. That at such a time like this, we can still come together and learn from your word. We're asking that your spirit will help us today so that we'll get the very best out of the study of your word in Jesus' name. We ask, O oh Lord, that the same spirit that inspired the word to be written will illuminate and shine upon the pages of the scriptures as we read together and study together today so that the study of the word will benefit and profit every one of us in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said a good amen. amen. I always like an amen that will make me know that you are there and you are ready for the study. We're now in study 17. In 2 Peter, we've been looking at the epistle of Peter. Uh, the general epistle, reaching to believers like you and I. And in this second epistle, we've been emphasizing the very fact that Peter wanted the people to know, the people of God to know, that Jesus Christ is coming soon. At that time, like in our day, some false prophets had risen up, some doubters had risen up, some scoffers and scorners had risen up, and they were beginning to doubt already the coming of the Lord. Not only did they have private doubts, but they were publicly talking to other people, trying to dissuade them, persuade them against belief in the second coming of the Lord. Therefore, Peter spent such a good time telling us that the Lord is coming again. That if you're a believer in the Bible, that you cannot miss the very fact that it is prophecy repeated over and over that Jesus is coming again. After he had now convinced the believers who are listening, who are meditating upon the word of God, that Christ is coming again. He, he now wants us to prepare and he's showing us what attitude you ought to have, what attitude I ought to have in preparing for the coming of the Lord. That's why as we're looking at 2 Peter chapter 3 today, verses 12 through to 14, we're looking at diligent preparation for God's eternal kingdom. Diligent preparation for God's eternal kingdom. Looking at it from verse 12. Open your Bible. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent, that ye may be able, that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. And you will see that Peter remained focused on the theme and the goal that he had till the very end of the epistle. You see, there are some preachers and there are some counselors and there are some soul winners. They are not able to stay on focus. They are not able to remain on the very subject they started with. But Peter, guided by the Spirit of God, he remained focused. Because he knew eh, there was no other thing important at this time. The Spirit of God that inspired him to write this epistle helped him not to get diverted to unimportant issues, irrelevant issues, things that will not contribute to their preparation for the coming of the Lord. His aim was to protect the people of God from false teachers. From those falls and the, the scoffers we have learned about. His goal was to help them, help the believers to keep their steadfastness until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why in these verses, as he was moving to a conclusion, he began to encourage the people of, that they should expect and prepare for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will see the way he does it in verse 12. He says, looking for looking for, be in a state of expectancy. And then in verse 13 again, in the middle it says, look 
for new heavens and a new earth. Keep on looking. Keep on expecting. Keep on preparing yourself. And when he gets to verse 14, he says, Wherefore, beloved, see that ye look for such things. You're looking, you're looking, you're looking. He wanted the believers to be in a state of expectancy. There should be a desire within them that will make them prepare and get ready for Christ as he comes to judge. Prepare for Christ as he comes to create the new heavens and the new earth. And as he comes to reign as a king of kings. And then to establish his eternal kingdom. That's why you'll find in three consecutive verses, he uses the word look for, look for, look for, looking for, and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. Then he says, nevertheless we're looking for the new heavens and the new earth. And then he concludes that section by saying, see that ye look for such things, be diligent so that you can be found in him, blameless, without spot, righteous, and holy. Without eagerly looking for an event, we do not prepare adequately for such an event. If the mind is distracted and occupied with some other earthly things, we shift our focus from the really essential thing. And that's what happened to the foolish virgins. Those foolish virgins, they knew that the bridegroom would come, but they were not prepared. That's why the apostle is impressing it on you, impressing it on me. Look for this thing. Expect it. Be prepared and be ready. As we look at the study tonight, we're considering three points. Number one, the destruction and dissolution of the earth with fervent heat. Destruction and dissolution of the earth with five-inch heat. Number two, the desire to dwell in the new heavens and the new earth. The desire to dwell in the new heavens and the new earth. Number three, diligence to be found in him, unblameable in holiness. Number one, the destruction and the dissolution of the earth with five-inch heat. Verse 12, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. It says we should be looking for, and it should be, we should be in such a readiness of heart, preparedness of heart, that we're even hasting towards it. We're eager that it will come. And we, it's like we're almost impatient. We're saying, oh Lord, when will you come? Because of the trials in the world and the temptations in the world and the problems in the world and the things we have to battle with, we're looking ahead. And we're looking at the time when Christ will come and he will take his own children home. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again so that I can take you unto myself so that where I am, there ye will be also. These believers knowing that Christ will definitely come. The expectation of their heart, the desire of their heart, the aim of living and the goal of their life is that whatever happens now, whatever does not happen now, they wanted to make it on that final day. That's why he said we're looking for and we're hasting unto the coming of the day of God. But then it says that day of God. It will be a day of happiness for the people of God, a day of sadness and gloom and judgment for the people of the world. That's why he repeats it again, wherein the heavens been on fire, the skies been on fire, the stars and the moon and the sun all falling. The heavens been on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall, be, shall melt with fervent heat. It tells us that that day of the Lord, we've studied this before, but you see, uh, Peter, by, led by the Spirit of God, repeats it again. He said it in verse 7. He said it in verse 10. He says it in verse 12 again. To show you, to show everyone that this is a very definite thing, it is going to happen. Look at verse 7. In verse 7 it says, For the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store. Reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. A day of wrath, a day of indignation, a day of judgment, a day of giving account of how they have lived their lives. A day when all the works of their hands and the whole earth will be totally destroyed and melted away in fire. And then in verse 10 it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, suddenly without any announcement and unexpectedly 
It will come for the people unprepared, unaware. It says the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. And the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. Everything will be burnt in the flames of the judgment of the Almighty God. And if men and women of our day, if they knew that this present earth and the works that are done therein shall be destroyed and dissolved with fire, they will not labor so much for that which perish, with that, that which will perish. But for that which endures unto everlasting life. In fact, even believers themselves, if believers really knew, if believers really believed that the heavens and the earth, which now are, are kept in store, reserved unto fire, and that the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. If we really believe that as believers, if we believe that the earth also, and the walls that are therein shall be burnt up, if we truly and really believe that the heavens be on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, what will be the consequence in our lives? Our lives, our aspirations, our ambition, our activities would focus on eternal things. A proper understanding of what is surely going to happen will make us to earnestly seek those things which are born. And we shall constantly set our affections on things above, not on things on the earth. And if you see that there are many believers today that uh, they look at material things of the world, and they look at the things, the constructions of the world, and they look at the business of the world, and they look at the material, financial things of the world as the most important thing, if there's any believer like that today, he is not considering the revelation of scripture, that all these things we see today, all these things we do today, everything on earth, the works that are therein, everything will be burnt off. Everything. If we really consider that, if we really believe that, our attitude will change. Our concentration will change. Our focus will change. The fact that the heavens and the earth shall be destroyed by fire and dissolved in fervent heat, that's repeated three times in these few verses, verse 7, verse 10, verse 12. The certainty of these coming events should lessen our hold on temporal things and make us focus on things eternal. In fact, it's not only in these three verses that that is revealed unto us, it's revealed in the Old Testament and in the New Testament all over the scripture that the things we see today, everything is going to go up in flames. In Psalm 50, verses 3 and 4. Psalm 50, verses 3 and 4. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. And you will see here the psalmist revealing to us that when God comes, he will come with real judgment, and the fire will devour before him. And that it will be a very tempestuous thing all around him as the judgment comes upon the whole world. If you knew that, how would you think about the things of the world? If, for example, you knew, if you knew that uh, you were building something by the side of the road, and while you are building and constructing, if the government officials were to come to you, and they would have told you uh, that, do you know that next week, that the paper has been signed, that all the buildings in this area, everything is going to be leveled. And there is no turning back. And the decision had been taken. And here you are, all the resources of your life, you are putting it on this building. And it shows you the paper, written very, very clearly, that all the buildings on this side, they are going to be destroyed in just one week. If you are a reasonable person, you will not continue to put all your resources, all your money, everything you have on that thing, because just next week, everything is going, to go, is going to go down. The same thing, the world in which we live. All that we are laboring for, all that we are concentrating on, all that we focus our lives on, that is not allowing us to consider our ways or prepare our hearts, 
and to prepare to meet the Lord that is not allowing us to focus on salvation, on holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. The Lord is telling us that everything will be melted away. Everything will be burnt, will be burnt off. And if we were reasonable, if we were really believing, we will spend less time, less time on the sins of the world and spend more time on preparing for eternity to meet our God. In Psalm 75, Psalm 75, reading from verse 3. The earth and all the inhabitants thereof are dissolved. I bear up the pillars of peace. Sila. Sila there means think of this. Stop and think. Stop and meditate. This is going to happen. What kind of person will you be? Now that you know that the earth and all the things therein will be totally dissolved. In verse 4, I said unto the fools, deal not foolishly. And to the wicked, lift not up your horn. Lift not up your horn on high. Speak not with a stiff neck. He said, when I consider the things that are going to happen, when I consider that the earth and everything will be totally burnt up, I began to advise, I began to counsel, I began to preach to these people that are foolish and wicked and sinful, telling them, why don't you stop all these things you are doing? Because you see, all the works of your hand and all the works of our hand all together, collectively, everything is going to be dissolved and destroyed. The consequence of that is we become wiser. We become wiser. And then we do things that will profit us for eternity. In Psalm 102, verses 25 and 26. Uh, Psalm 102, verse 25 of old. As thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish. The heavens, they shall perish. The work of our hands, they shall perish. Even the work of God's son, that is, all that he has molded, all that he has created, the globe, the world, the earth, everything, they shall perish. But thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, as a vesture. Shall thou change them, and they shall be changed. You see, it's revealed over and over that the things we see now, and the things that look attractive now, and the things that take our attention now, and the things that are there, and it appears that that's the most important thing. Well, what if I don't have salvation? If I can have, uh, you know, some money, and have some building, have some material things, and I can say this is mine, and that is mine. After all of that, I have me it. Why shouldn't I concentrate my whole life on getting those things to uh, going to go up in flames? They're going to be destroyed. That's the reason you need to call yourself back to wisdom and say, it isn't wise to spend all my life on these things that shall be dissolved, that shall perish. I would rather labor for things that endure unto life eternal. In Isaiah chapter 24, verse 19. Isaiah 24, verse 19. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean, dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. Now, you, you need to understand the way Isaiah writes prophecy. When Isaiah writes, he writes as if it's done already. That's why he said unto us, a child is born. As if it's, it's happened already. Unto us, a son is given. As if it's done already. It's because of the certainty of that prophecy. Because it will definitely happen. That's why Isaiah wrote with assurance and certainty. Nothing can change this one. The earth is utterly broken down. And the earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro. Like a drunkard. And shall be moved like a cottage. And a transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it. And it shall fall and not rise again. And it shall come to pass in that day. You see now, it's telling us it's still to happen in that day. And yet in the previous verses, he has written as if it's done already. That's because the decision had been taken by Almighty God. And there is nothing that will change that decision. But the day is still coming. And it says it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high. 
and the kings of the earth upon the earth, and they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the peace, and shall be shut up in the prison. After many days shall they be visited. Then in verse 23 it says, Then the moon shall be confounded, and the sun ashamed, when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion, and in Jerusalem, and before his ancients gloriously. So you will see then the testimony of the whole scripture that these things are going to happen. The earth is going to be dissolved. And the, the problem is many people, they have difficulty in believing. Because even after the warning has been given, and after the word has been spoken, and after we have seen prophecy upon prophecies being fulfilled in scripture, when this prophecy comes, it says like, no, it may not happen now. It may not happen now. Let me still focus on these material things. Let me still get all the money I can get and build all the houses I can build and do whatever I can do because it may not happen now. The Lord is saying the day of the Lord is at hand and it will come suddenly. It will come unexpectedly. It will come as a thief in the night. And when it comes, this is what will happen. The destruction and the dissolution of the earth with fervent heat. In Isaiah chapter 34 verse 4. Isaiah 34 verse 4. And all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved. And the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. And all their hosts shall fall down. As the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. I want you to please understand that David did not know Isaiah. And yet he said the same thing. Isaiah did not copy from David, and yet he said the same thing. And Peter, in the New Testament, inspired by the Spirit of God, saying the same thing. And when all these that live thousands of years apart, when they say the same thing, that the earth will be destroyed, and the works that are therein will melt with fervent heat, you better believe it is going to happen and remove your mind, remove your mind from all the material things of this world and prepare to meet the Lord your God in Nahum chapter 1. Nahum chapter 1, here is another prophet of the Old Testament telling us exactly the same thing that the others have told us. And you remember when Joseph was interpreting the dream of uh, Pharaoh. Uh, the, 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 the dream was given two times. And then it says, because of the confirmation, it will definitely happen. That's why the dream is repeated. And when you see these prophecies being repeated, David saying it, and Isaiah saying it, and others in the New Testament, Old Testament saying the same thing, it is a confirmation. It will definitely, definitely happen. Nahum chapter 1 verses 5 and 6. The mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burnt at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is put out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. The same thing, telling us it will definitely happen. Well, if you, you've read it from David, uh, from the Psalms, you've read it from Isaiah, you've read it from Prophet Nahum, about the Lord Jesus Christ now, telling us exactly the same thing, that this is what is going to happen at the end of time. In Mark chapter 13, Mark chapter 13, from verse 24, and, but in those days, after the tribulation, the sun shall be darkened. And the moon shall not give her light. The stars of heaven shall fall. And the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And you see what the Lord is saying. He's saying that these things will definitely happen. Uh, the, the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, everything will be affected. Then in verse 31, it says, heaven and earth shall pass away. Heaven and earth, all that you see now. These are the words of Jesus Christ. It is say, heaven and earth may pass away. Heaven and earth shall pass away. The sky and everything you see and the earth. Heaven and earth shall pass away. But my words shall not pass away. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, reading from verse 10. Hebrews 1, verse 10 and verse 11. And thou, Lord, 
in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hand. The earth on the one hand, the heavens on the other hand. The earth and the heavens. Then it says, they shall perish. The heavens and the earth, they shall perish. All that you see today, and the works of man, man's hand, they shall perish. But thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. And then you get rid of them. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. From whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. From whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And you will see then from the revelation of scripture. That is revealed over and over. That the earth will melt away with fervent heat. That even the heavens that you see now will be rolled up together. Like clothes and then thrown away. What's then the conclusion? And what is then to be your attitude and my attitude? That leads us to point number two. The desire to dwell in, new, in the new heavens and the new earth. The desire to dwell in the new heavens and the new earth. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 13. Nevertheless, nevertheless, we according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth. It says, yes, the earth will be dissolved. Yes, the elements will make you with fervent heat. Even what you see of the heavens and the galaxies and all the sky, everything will be rolled away. And the stars and the planets, everything will go out of existence. Because the fire, the conflagration will burn up everything, melt everything away. Then it says, now, that's what is going to happen to the earth. That's what is going to happen to the heavens. That's what is going to happen to the property of the unbelievers and the people that concentrate all their lives on the things of this world. He says, but we are believers. Nevertheless, we, we children of God, we, those who are born again, we, those who are preparing to meet the Lord, we, those who have been washing the blood of the Lamb, and they are focusing on the coming event, on the coming of the Lord. We, those who hold the things of this world with loose hands, and they take the things of the Lord seriously at that. We, those who are focusing on the really essential thing and the coming of the Lord. It says, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, it's not a baseless uh, expectation. It's not a baseless desire. It's not a baseless aim or goal or ambition. It's according to his promise. We are looking. We look for the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherein dwelleth righteousness. You will see in these three verses, I said it before, verse 12, verse 13, and verse 14, that he uses the expression looking for, or we look for, or ye look for, these expressions, in three, these expressions in three consecutive verses, they encourage and instruct us that we should have a passionate desire, a strong desire. We're looking for something. Our knowledge of what will soon perish. Our knowledge of what will soon be forgotten. And the knowledge of that which will abide eternally should create a permanent, a permanent desire in us to concentrate on what will never perish. Isn't it wise to give up what you can never keep in favor of what abides forever? After all, if you don't give it up now, it will be burnt up. It will be burnt away. It will be taken away from you. Is it not wise then to voluntarily give up? Not to set your hearts on them. And not to die because of them. Not to have hypertension because of Not to kill yourself because of running after the things that are going to perish. Is it not wise to give up the things that you can never keep in favor of the things that abide forever? That the earth and all the works produced by man's efforts will be destroyed and dissolved is certain. And it will be sooner than later. The time is fast approaching. Men are ignorant of these events which had been decided and determined by the Almighty God. You know, God cannot lie, God cannot fail, and God will not change. Knowing this, our mind shall be in a state of readiness, in a state of expectancy. We know it will occur. No doubt about it. Because the word of God affirms it. We know it will happen. And we should not allow the event to take us by surprise. 
The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah took those people by surprise. But they were told beforehand, it was announced beforehand, are we going to be like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah? That even though the things were announced beforehand, it's still taking us by surprise? And the destruction of Babylon, it was announced beforehand. And yet, it took many of those Babylonians by surprise. Are we going to be like those heathens, those pagans, those unbelievers in Babylon? And even though these things have been announced over and over, announced thousands of years before, it will still take us by surprise. How about the destruction of Jerusalem? Jerusalem of old, that destruction took them by surprise. Millions of them died unnecessarily because they didn't take to heart what the Lord Jesus Christ had said concerning the destruction of Jerusalem. They were told beforehand. They did not believe. They did not prepare themselves. What about the things that are to happen now? Is he going to take us by surprise? He's going to take many sinners in the world by surprise. Even many church goers is going to take them by surprise. I dare say there are even born again Christians that do not know these things. They have never heard, they have never read, they have never thought about it, that the world, the earth, and the things that are there in, everything is going to be destroyed. And it's going to take many, many people by surprise. That's why Jesus Christ said as a snare, shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the earth. But the true Christian looks forward to the return of his Savior, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he prepares himself so that he can be found in holiness when Christ shall come. Do you see what the apostle is telling us what we ought to do here? As a result of what we know is going to happen, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, we're looking for the new heavens and the new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. In Titus chapter 2, Titus chapter 2, Verses 13 and 14, Titus 2, verses 13 and 14. Looking for that blessed hope. Look for it. Expect it. It's going to happen. And therefore you're expecting, you're looking up, you're preparing yourself. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ in verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. All iniquity. Inward iniquity, outward iniquity. Hidden iniquity, exposed iniquity. Known iniquity and the one you are hiding privately that others may not know. He died so that he can redeem us from all iniquity. Because without redemption, cleansing from all iniquity, we will not be prepared for the coming of the Lord who gave himself for us. That he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. In Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 20. One. For our conversation is in heaven. The word conversation then, the original actually means our citizenship is in heaven. Our heart is there. Our treasures are there. Our mind is there. And our Lord is there. The bridegroom is there. What is really precious to us is over there in heaven. Our feet touch the ground. But our mind is not here. And our heart is not buried here in the earth because our conversation, our citizenship is in heaven. From whence also we look, we look, we look, we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You will see as we read from epistle to epistle, the state of expectancy and the state of readiness and the state of preparedness. You will see how it is emphasized over and over and over again. We look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. And that's the reason we're looking up. We, it's like we're tired with this old body. Get sick and get swell and get sick again and get swell. Get tired and get strengthened and get tired again and get strengthened. And then it gets weak and gets strong. We're tired of this body. And we're looking up to the Lord that when he comes, before the judgment comes upon the whole world, he will change our vile body. This is a fleshly body that he may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. 
risen body, glorious body, glorified body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. That's the expectation of the believers. And we're looking for that time. The new heavens and the new earth. And a new body also. And a new state of being. When the Lord will come. Actually when. Have you noticed what Peter said? He said, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth. By the way, what does he mean by that? According to his promise. Which means, in another place in the scriptures, the Lord had already provided, had already promised, already prophesied that the new heavens and the new earth will be created. That's why Peter was saying, nevertheless we, according to his promise, which he made to us before, that he's going to create the new heavens and the new earth, we are looking for those new, for the new heaven and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. The question is, where was that prophesied before? That God will create the new heavens, and the new earth. Actually, in two places, Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, shall not come into mind. You see, that's why it said, nevertheless, we according to his promise. According to his promise. According to his promise, we're looking for new heavens and the new earth. Because God has said, far back in Isaiah, more than 700 years before Peter ever wrote, almost 700 years, behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. And a former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. He continues in verse 18, but be ye glad and rejoice forever. In that, in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing. And her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem. And joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her. Nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more death, an infant of days. Nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old. And the sinner, being an hundred years old, shall be accursed of the time of the millennium. And he reigns upon the whole earth. That the people that still use their free will, and they will still rebel, even at the time of the millennium, if they died at a hundred years of age, they will say that they died as just children. And such a sinner dying at a hundred years of age will be that he was still under his curse at the time of universal peace. Come on to verse 25. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and the door shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, says the Lord. That's the promise Peter was referring to when he said, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, we're looking for the new heavens and the new earth. In Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22. For the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord. So shall your seed and your name remain. You'll see then that in the Old Testament, this new heaven and the new earth had been promised. And that's why it's in, that's, we're looking for it. We're eagerly waiting for it. And we're preparing ourselves so that we'll be ready when the time shall come. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. Hebrews 11, 13. Then these all died in faith, not having received the promise, the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. You see the people that have the right attitude? The people that know that this earth is just transitory. That uh, there's nothing permanent, nothing stable, nothing eternal here. That this earth is going to be destroyed. And they were looking for something better. Something more glorious. They just live in this world like strangers and pilgrims on the earth. 
In verse 14, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they must have had opportunity to have returned. Which means their heart was just on the country to come, on the land to come, on the new heavens and the new earth. And if they had been mindful of the things of the past, saying that they were like the things of the world, they would have had occasion to have returned. That's why some people backslide, although they say they are born again and they come to the Lord. Their mind is not focused on heaven. Their mind is not focused on the glory that shall be revealed. Their mind is not focused on eternal things, spiritual things. And they're always looking back, always thinking back, if I were in the world, if I didn't give my life to Christ, if it were not because of church, if it were not because of this emphasis on holiness, holiness, if it were not because of this and because of that, I know what I would have been. And if you're always looking back, you'll, you'll soon go back. But these people were told about them. Truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had the opportunity to have returned. But now, they desire a better country that is and heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared them a city. He has prepared them a city. And that's what we've been looking for, that glorious city, the new heaven and the new earth. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him, that expect his coming, that prepare for his coming, unto them that look for him, shall he appear the second time without sin, unto salvation. And the Lord Jesus Christ himself, before he left, he told his own disciples, and in telling his own disciples, he's telling us too, that we ought to get prepared for that time that is coming. In Luke chapter 21, Luke 21, from verse 28. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh, draweth near. That is when you begin to see the prophecies that Jesus Christ predicted, prophesied, of the coming, of the signs of his own coming. When you see those things begin to happen, then you look up. Then you know that the time is very near. Your redemption draweth near. And he spake to them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now near at hand. It says you farmers, Israelites, many of them were farmers. It says when you look at the trees, and you look at the condition of the trees, then you know that summer is very near. So, so likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is near at hand. That that day we've been talking about is very near at hand. And then it says, Very near unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. This generation, the generation that sees all the things happening, Rumors of war, false prophets, false Christ, false miracles, and the hearts of men failing them, and the volcanoes, and the pestilence, and the incredible diseases, all coming upon the world at the same time. When you see all these things coming upon the world, you know that the time is very near at hand. And then it says in verse 33, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And take it to yourselves. And take it to yourselves. We're talking to believers. Take it to yourselves. Because we're not just going to get prepared automatically without preparing yourself. Take it unto yourselves. Less at any time. Less at any time. And there are times when some believers don't think that spiritual things are necessary. When their minds are set on earthly things. Less at any time. There are times when some believers will, will forget spiritual standards, Christian standards. They will forget the coming of the Lord. Less at any time. 
There are some times when you forget yourself. Maybe it's the time of wedding. Maybe it's the time of childbearing. Maybe it is the time of promotion in the place of work. Maybe it's the time of this or that. That you forget that all these things are going to be destroyed. Take it therefore to yourself, lest at any time your heart be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life. Here are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, be very careful because the cares of this life, I'm asking the things of this life, I'm getting this, I'm getting this, I'm getting that. Take it lest the cares of this life and uh, come upon you and then that day come upon you unaware. And the thing just intoxicates you as if you are drunk. And money intoxicates you as if you are drunk. And the merriment of the world and the joy of the world and the ceremonies of the world and the success in the world gets into your mind, gets into your head, intoxicates you as if you are drunk. That's why Jesus said, take it yourself. Let's at any time your heart be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and the cares of this life. And so that they come upon you unaware, because for as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. They'll be walking up and down, doing business as usual, talking as usual, discussing as usual, making negotiations as usual, and that day will come upon them unprepared. Watch ye therefore in Versailles is saved, and pray ye, pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. Understand? Before the Son of Man. The Lord is calling upon us to watch and to prepare ourselves. Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, reading from verse 1 and then verse 7, verse 8, verse 27. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. The first heaven. And the first earth were passed away. And now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Isn't this exactly what we've been reading about? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heaven and a new earth. It says, for the first heaven and for the first earth has passed away, were passed away, and there was no more sin. In verse 7, he that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Verse 8, for the fearful, cannot take a Christian stand to a preach. Cannot stand on the word of holiness, and the principle of holiness, and the life of holiness. I'm afraid of what they will say, what they will do to me. The persecution that will come because of that. I'm so much afraid of being righteous, and being truthful, and being holy, and being honest. Because of what the people will say, what they will do. But the fearful and the unbelieving, the people that hear all these things, the world is going to go up in flames. The earth is going to go up in flames. And all the works that are there in, and they're still unbelieving, and they're abominable. Those who do abominable things, feel these things, obscene things. And the murderers, the murderers, and you know that the New Testament says, he that hates his brother in the past is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And the whoremongers, the adulterers and the fornicators, and the homosexuals and all those people, and the sorcerers, the witches and the wizards, and the idolaters, those who are worshipping idols, and all liars, all liars, whether you lie in writing or you lie in speaking, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And then in verse 27, and there shall in no wise enter into it, into the new city, into the, into the new Jerusalem, into the new heavens and the new earth. There shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, manufactures a lie, but they which are rich in the land book of life. We'll come back to Second Peter, chapter 3. When I in verse 14, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, seeing that you are looking for the new heavens and the new earth, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Uh, do you spend time to wash in the blood of the Lamb, to examine your life, to see whether you are ready for the coming of the Lord or not. If you are going to be ready for the coming of the Lord, it's not something you just do haphazardly. It's not something you do with 
an unprepared heart, with just a lazy kind of, of uh, attitude, but you're diligent about it because of all things that are going to happen. See that ye look for such things, the new heavens and the new earth, be diligent that ye may be found in him, found in him, not outside him, but in peace in peace and without sport and blameless. That's what the Lord is telling us. He wants us to be well prepared, prepared for the coming of the Lord. You know, those who are going to be ready for the coming of the Lord, it's not going to be accidental. I wasn't preparing, I just got ready. Nothing like that. But you'll be diligent in preparing yourself. Diligent in preparing yourself. He is coming and you need to prepare. In First Corinthians chapter 1 verse 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. So that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are waiting, you are waiting, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Temptations are around, but I'm waiting. Trials come, but I'm waiting. I'll not give up. Difficulties come my way, but I'm waiting for the coming of the Lord. And maybe success comes, but that success will not intoxicate me or tie me down. I'm waiting for the coming of the Lord. And it may be there's misunderstanding or discord or whatever, but that doesn't bother me because I'm waiting for something. I overlook all this is surrounding me, and I'm waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there are people that their lives are filled with blemishes and spots and stain and secret sin and the murmuring and the grumbling and the complaining and their lives are totally dirty. With all these little, little things, a little stain there, a little stain there, a little stain there, and it doesn't worry them, it doesn't bother them. And they just shrug their shoulders. I was born again 10 years ago. I was born again 14 years ago. And the stains are there. And the spots are there. And the blemishes are there. And yet they will not worry about it. But it's saying that if you are preparing for the coming of the Lord, who shall confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in that day. The day of our Lord Jesus Christ is coming for the people that are getting ready, the people that are preparing themselves. And if they see any stain, any blemish, any spot, they are washing everything in a way with the blood of the Lamb. You will not wait until other believers will see something visible. It's not, it's not when something is visible, when it's in your heart, when it's in your mind, when it's in your thought, when it's in your motive, when it's in your lifestyle. And the Lord sees it before we are able to see it. At such a time, it's when you go to the fountain of the blood of Jesus Christ and you are cleansed and you are washed so that you'll be blameless ready, getting ready, prepared for the coming of the Lord. In Philippians chapter 1 verse 27, Philippians chapter 1 verse 27, only let your conversation, only let your lifestyle, only let your behavior, only let your character be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Your lifestyle, your character, your behavior, your conversation, the words of your mouth, your interaction, relationship with one another, let it be as it becomes, as it befits the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent. Whether we are together or we don't see what you are doing, be such a Christian that your life, your lifestyle is straightforward. Whether we see what you do or we don't see what you do. Have you forgotten that you became a Christian voluntarily? Have you forgotten that you gave your life to the Lord Jesus Christ by your free volition? Have you forgotten that it was your personal decision that made you to leave sin and to come to the Lord? Have you forgotten that it was your personal decision that made you to say, I love holiness, I love the way of holiness and the doctrine of holiness? Have you forgotten it's your personal decision that makes you to stay in a church like this? It wasn't because we saw you. You were not trying to impress us when you gave your life to Jesus Christ. It wasn't because brother so-and-so was there, sister so-and-so was there. Why is it after you have become a Christian and you are studying the word of God? Your life now is dependent on when brother so-and-so is there, I live right. When sister so-and-so is watching, I live right. But whether we are present with you or else we are absent, that I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, 
with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. It will not be I service. It will not be that we're like, you know, little, little children who don't know the essence of what they're doing. That when mom and dad are there, it's then they'll try to behave. But when we're not there, then they will do whatever they want. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 13 to the end, he may establish your heart unblameable in holiness. Not just holiness. Not just holiness. Not just holiness. We have, it's like many people have settled down this external holiness. Of course, that's necessary. That's necessary. Our outward life ought to be clean. And some don't even have that nowadays. The external holiness ought to be there. Your dressing, your appearance, your language, your interaction, your behavior externally. But it goes beyond that. But there are some people that feel that the external holiness is enough for them. But to the end, he may establish your heart, your heart, unblameable in holiness. That the Lord looks at you within. He looks at your heart. He looks at your motive. He looks at your desires. He looks at your aim, at your goal, at everything you are thinking of within. In the internal life, he looks at your heart and he sees that you're unblameable in holiness before God. You know, you can look like an angel before one another. And the other brother may look at you and say, oh, I praise God for you. And while we're praising God for you, God looks at your heart and you are not holy in the sight of God. The thoughts in your heart, the motives in your mind, the desires you have, the lusts in your heart, that the closest person to you may not know. Uh, the holiness before men, that should not get us anywhere. It should not get us anywhere. But when you're unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, the one who can see everything, who can see through and we cannot cover up in the sight of the Lord at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. That's why we get prepared. We make sure that the inner life is washed and cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. In First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. Reading from verse 13. First Peter 1 verse 13. Wherefore, get up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, those are the only kinds of children God has. As obedient children, those are the only kinds of children that will inherit the kingdom of God. As obedient children. Those are the only kinds of children that please the Father. And the Father will be able to say, Here is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. As obedient children, these are the only kinds of children preparing for the coming of the Lord. Disobeying the commandments of God will not prepare me for the coming of the Lord. Disregarding my consecration to the Lord and the Spirit of the Lord reminding me, remember, remember the consecration you made in years gone by. Re disregarding those, conse those consecrations will not make me precious in the sight of God, will not prepare me for the coming of the Lord. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to your former laws in your ignorance. There was a time we were ignorant and there were things we did. And there were things we said. And there were things we thought. And there were places we went. And there were dresses we wore. And there were things we drank. And there were things we smoked. In our ignorance. But now it says, as obedient children, and you are preparing for the coming of the Lord, not fashioning yourselves according to your former laws in your ignorance. But as she which has called you is holy, so be ye holy. As he which has called you is holy, as he which has called you, David committed adultery. Is it David that called you? Abraham told a lie. Is it Abraham that called you? Peter denied the Lord. Is it Peter that called you? As he which has called you is holy. It's almighty God has called you. Whatever others have done, whatever Samson has done, whatever Judas Iscariot did, whatever Achan did, whatever Solomon did, What's that to you? But I see, which has called you is holy. So be ye holy in all manner of conversation because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. 
uh, the standard of holiness that the Lord is calling us to is his own holiness. Not the holiness of Abraham, of David, of Solomon, of Samson, of Judas Iscariot, of Jezebel, or any other person, but as Almighty God that called you as he is holy, so be ye holy if you are preparing for the coming of the Lord. In Second Peter chapter 1, Second Peter chapter 1, from verse 5. And besides this, giving all diligence, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you, and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you don't have all these things, you are barren in the sight of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that means you don't have a continuing relationship with the Lord. Because, listen to me, when you have a relationship with the Lord, intimate relationship and fellowship with the Lord, you'll be fruitful, you'll be productive, you will not be barren. If you have a relationship with the Lord, you'll have the knowledge and the virtue and the, and the temperance and the patience and the godliness and the brotherly kindness and the brotherly love and charity. You're going to have them as a result of the fruit of your relationship with the Almighty God. That's why it says, if this is being you, and they are bound, and they increase, and they multiply, it says they make sure that you are not the barren or fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things, we're just going to church, just following them. I'm a Christian. I carry the Bible. I pray to you. I do this, I do that. And yet it's lacking. All these fruits of the Spirit is blind. I cannot see a part of. And has forgotten that he was purged from his whole sin. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and your election sure. For if you do this thing, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And you'll see the preparation that we need to make. It's all over there in the scriptures, and as you are listening, then you need to really pray and prepare yourself in First John chapter 3, First John chapter 3, reading verse 3. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, purifies himself. You can't do it for me, I can't do it for you. Purifies himself. Your wife cannot do it for you. He purifies himself. Your parents cannot do it for you. He purifies himself. Every man that has this hope in him, the hope of being with the Lord when he comes, the hope of not just losing everything you have in the devastation, destruction, and the conflagration, the, the burning up of the earth and all the works that are there in it, the one that has the hope in him that he will reign with the Almighty God and with Jesus Christ forever and ever. Every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. And in First Thessalonians chapter 5, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. Here it says, Abstain from all appearance of evil. When last did you read that? Abstain from all appearance of evil. When last did you think about this? Abstain from all appearance of evil. When last did you remember that God is going to require from you the meaning and the application of this verse abstain from all appearance of evil. When last did you think it is not only the evil that you do, it's not only the concrete things that are evil, but the very appearance of evil that the Lord is saying you should cleanse yourself from them and separate yourself away from them. When last did you think that even an appearance of evil can get you unprepared for the coming of the Lord? When last did you meditate on the word of God that says, abstain from all appearance of evil? And then it tells for us and the very God of peace, sanctify you holy, and I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithfully see that calleth you who also will do it. In Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 14, Hebrews 12, from verse 14, follow peace with all men. You know this one counts 
as we're preparing for the coming of the Lord, follow peace with all men. All men. Some men are difficult. But you know, don't allow those difficult men to take the kingdom of God from you. Follow peace with all men. Some men could be hard. Follow peace with all men. Your landlord, your co tenants your employers, your employees, your neighbors. Follow peace with all men. Some people, you have not offended them, but they're going to pick up offense. It's like they're looking for a fight. But if you're, come, if you're waiting for the coming of the Lord, follow peace with all men. And some people are going to accuse you falsely. And if you are going to wash off every false accusation, you're not going to be at peace. We wake up in the morning, you know the Lord may come today. The Lord may come anytime. Follow peace with all men and holiness. Peace is not enough. Peace is necessary. Peace is essential. And you must pursue peace with all men. And then and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. I want you to examine your, your Lord spiritually. And as we look at everything there, if holiness is not there now, what are you going to bring holiness into your life? Into your heart, into your thoughts, into the words of your mouth, into your lifestyle. Holiness in your service. When are you going to bring holiness there? Because whatever load you pack, when Jesus comes, if holiness is not part in there, and holiness is not part of your life, and part of everything that you are preparing for, you are not going to be able to meet the Lord on, on that final day. Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Look in diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, when he would have inherited the blessing, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, because he found no place of repentance, even though he sought it carefully with tears. The Lord has told us in what we have studied today, He says that we should be diligent so that we will be found in Him in peace, without spot and without blame. If you have the desire of going with the Lord when He comes, if your desire is not just to come to church, just to worship now, and then when the role is called up yonder, then we, we don't find you. If your desire is that when the Lord comes, I want to be there, I want to be with Him, then you know. Holiness is very essential, very, very important. And you have heard, as we have studied today, what the Lord is telling us and what the Lord has told us very, very clearly, that wherefore, beloved, see that ye look for such things. Be diligent, be diligent, please, be diligent, that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot, without blame. The blood of Jesus Christ is still available to wash us whiter than snow. And I can wash you today and cleanse you today. Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord, just forget about every other person around you. Forget about every other thing. Forget about the things of this earth. I'm getting this. I'm running for this. I'm rushing for this. And call upon the name of the Lord and say, Lord, I need to be ready. Look away from the people. Look away from everyone and anyone. And just say, Lord, I want to be ready when you come. 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 The only thing that will matter on that final day is the holiness of heart and holiness of life that the Lord has said you cannot throw the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. Are you still committing sin? Outward sin? Inward sin? Regular sin? Frequent sin? Daily sin? Or just secret sin that nobody knows and you are hiding? Why don't you tell the Lord and be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Remember, follow peace with all men, follow peace with all men, follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Are you holy enough for the coming of the Lord? Are you holy enough for the, for the coming of the Lord? Or do you have sinful thoughts, sinful desires, sinful motives, sinful actions, sinful behavior, sinful utterances, sinful conversations? It's your heart dirty. It's your life dirty in the sight of God. Why don't you examine yourself 
I say, yes, Lord. I want to be ready when you come. I want to be ready when you come. I want to be ready when you come. Every man that has this hope in him purifies himself. Purifies himself. Purifies himself. Even as he is pure. Are you as pure as he is? Are you unblameable in holiness in the sight of the Lord? Or is there a sin you are hiding there? An iniquity you are hiding there? A blemish you are hiding there? A stain in your life you are hiding there? Guilty conscience. Your conscience is telling you. Your conscience is telling you. This is not right. This is not right. This is not right. When are you going to take them away and be washed in the blood of the Lamb? He may come today. Who knows when, when he will come? If you are not ready now, when will you be ready? If you don't plunge yourself in the blood that flows from Emmanuel's side, when are you going to be cleansed? If we confess our sins, it's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. From all unrighteousness, little children, these things are out unto, unto you that you may not sin. But if any man sin, we have an advocate for the Father. He is the propitiation for our sins, not for us only, but for the sins of the whole world. The opportunity is there for you today. The privilege is there for you today to call on the name of the Lord so that all those sins can be wiped, wiped away and washed away and cleansed away. Let him do it. Let him do it. Let him do it. Let him do it. Let him take all those things away from your life. Remember, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Are you just coming to the church? You don't want to see the Lord? You don't want to prepare for the coming of the Lord? The earth is going to be burnt up with all the works that are there. And when everything goes up in flames, my brother, my sister, where do you want to be? See that she look for these things. Seeing that you look for these things, be diligent, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without fault and blameless. You need the holiness of heart. You need the holiness of life. Holiness like unto the law. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Be ye holy, for I am holy. That's the standard of the holiness that it will take you to heaven. That will make you ready and prepared for the coming of the Lord. Every man that has this soap in him, every woman that has this soap in her, every boy, every girl that has this soap in him, purifies, purifies, purifies himself, purifies herself, even as Christ is pure. Even as Christ is pure. Even as Christ is pure. Impurity will hinder you. From seeing his face on that final day. Unrighteousness will hinder you from seeing his face on that final day. Sin, secret sin, besetting sin, a stain here, a stain there, a stain here, a stain there, a blemish there, a spot there, it will hinder you from seeing him on that final day. Why don't you call upon the name of the Lord and say, Lord, cleanse me, wash me, touch me. Purify me. Take every stain away and be ready for the coming of the Lord.